Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our December 2023 uh, Money Matters episode. Um, today, we will be talking about financial, um, your, uh, keeping your financial data safe and secure online. And we have an awesome panel set up today. Um, my name is Matthew, and I'm your host with uh, uh, United Way Suncoast. And I'm joined today with Dr. Peter Trakis. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, I'm Dr. Peter Trakis. I'm the director of the USF College of Education's Gus A. Stavros Center for Free Enterprise and Economic Education. And what we, we do is provide resources and support of educators, students in the community in the Tampa Bay area about uh, financial literacy, economics, and the like. And we're glad to be joining you and partnering with the United Way in doing this. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. And we are going to be um, having a fantastic uh, webinar today for folks who are new to our Money Matters series. Every month we come together to talk about financial topics that are important to you and promoting your financial stability. And like I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and keeping your information safe online. Um, I don't know about you, but I do a lot of my shopping online and it's really easy to overshare your uh, financial information putting in your credit card information. So today we are joined by a cybersecurity expert to talk about what this looks like, how to keep your information safe, and what red flags to keep an eye out for. Um, so as I mentioned today, we're going to be joined by um, Amy Church. She's a senior network engineer at um, Six Watch. Um, and for those who don't know what Six Watch is, um, it, they are a cybersecurity company based here in Florida, um, and Amy has extensive knowledge of the current cybersecurity threat landscape for organizations and indiv individuals. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. We'd love for, to have you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you guys. Um, as you said, I'm Amy Church. I work for Six Watch currently. Um, I've been in IT and cybersecurity for more years than I care to share. Um, started in college when um, I didn't. I refused to let uh, computers beat me. And so, what the best way to do that is to to dominate them and tell them what to do. So um, I've been in in the field for a long time, and, and just being aware of um, what's out there and what can as Facebook's come on the scene, as all of the things in social media have come on the scene, that's the era and the um, landscape in which my career has developed is watching those things come about and being just trying to help keep small and mid-sized companies, whether from internal IT or um, as a partner, just secure and safe. Awesome. Thank you. And um, for those who are joining us, um, we have some questions we prepared for Amy today. Um, but you are also more than welcome to uh, share any questions you have as well. Um, if you're joining us, you should have the Q&A button. Um, so if you have any questions for Amy um, on anything we're talking about today, please put them in the Q&A box so we have a chance to um, ask her. And then also for those who are joining us, a uh, recording of this will be posted on YouTube within, um, within the next couple of days. Um, and so, uh, Pete, I would love for you to start off if you have any questions for Amy. Of course. Yeah, Amy. So... You know, with the extensive data collection by online companies, everybody's asking you all the time for your email address and your address and all this stuff. Um, what are the most common ways our personal information is utilized and how can we as an individual gain more control over that data? So I think the, the primary way that that information is used is to target us with uh, advertising, targeted marketing. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways to catch us with our guard down. Um, everybody wants a piece of us, whether it's um, whatever company it may be, whatever they're selling, whatever, they all want our attention. And that is the biggest thing they are are going for is what will grab our attention, what will um, will get us to, to take the clickbait, what will get us to spend our money with them. Interesting. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, so there's a lot of you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of ways that companies are collecting data. Um, there's a lot of websites out there that you can put your information in. Um, and so one of the big things that we talk about in cybersecurity are, um, you know, the the malicious actors out there, the folks that are trying to exploit your data, to obtain your data. Um, so can you spend some time to talk more about the techniques that these actors use to collect folks' individual um, information, their personal information, their their bank accounts, um, and how people can identify and protect themselves from the tactics that these malicious actors are using. They are, uh, let's just say it's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry to be a malicious actor out there. I mean, there are more funds, more money, more 
um, benefits I, if, on that side of the malicious actors, then we care to acknowledge or realize. Um, and so staying ahead of them, we have to be smart, we have to be diligent, we have to be aware um, and not asleep on the job and thinking um, things like social media posts, everything we post on social media that's public is out there to be uh, gleaned from, to be, so whether you're doing a, um, or what are those, those quizzes, what's your favorite dog, like your favorite um, ice cream, your, what was your first pet's name, what road did you grow up on? What do those all sound like? Those are all those like security questions for your bank account that you use to retrieve your passwords. Every one of those quizzes, and I'm not saying every one of those quizzes is bad, but they all set up that information that if somebody gets a hold of those, who can't, who couldn't answer your security questions based on on watching a few of those uh, quizzes you filled out um, or learn your personality type. Um, they're all fun. We all like let our guard down. Oh, it's a game. We're going to fill this out and, and all is going to be well. But stopping to think whenever we're online and interacting, we're not in the privacy of our home. We're out in the public forum and what we share and what we post there, anybody and everybody can hear. And so it's kind of like being in the middle of a train station um, and not in the middle of your privacy of your own home where everybody's listening and can can hear and see what you've posted. Um Thing, I think other ways that they they go about to gain your information are giveaways. Um, how many times do you see win a chance at this or a chance at that? All you have to do is fill in this information. Sure. And can you give me just a moment? Thank you. Sure. My apologies. <laughs> um, so they gain our information there as well. Um, I think staying diligent and being aware if something's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. And so watching what... Um, what we post, why are we posting it? Why are they asking for this? Um, are all, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, ways that they get, gain information from us. And I, I appreciate that you shared that about, um, you know, overexposing yourself online, um, especially with those quizzes. There's a, a funny meme that I've seen uh, and it's like, uh, complete this Harry Potter quiz to see what house you're in and we'll need to your mother's made a name for that. And it's like, it's that kind of thinking where it's obvious in those instances, but a lot of the times, you know, what what was the name of your first pet? Um, that's a really common security mm -hmm. question. So I appreciate that something as, as, you know, mundane as, you know, those kind of questions can be used to against us. So I really appreciate that you flagged that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop filling out those quizzes. Um, Amy, let me ask you a question, kind of along that lines, um, with those, uh, with, the, what are some of the red flags, the subtle red flags that are warning signs that we over, over often overlook when sharing personal information online? And, and how can we develop an, a better awareness to protect ourselves? I think being aware of what browser you're using when you're doing that um, and what are the things that are built into that browser to, um, to alert you, like Google Chrome, Edge, Safari, they all have that security lock in the uh, address bar there for us to say, hey, this is a secure site or this is not a secure site. If you're getting ready to enter private information or fill out um, insurance forms or a credit application, there better be a lock up in that corner. Um, if there's not, then it's highly likely someone is in imitating that site and you're no longer secure. Uh, all three of the Google, Safari, Edge, the three main players, I think Firefox also has it, though it's not one I use very often. Um, if you hover over that lock or click on that lock, it will give you more information, a breakdown of what is going on on that site. Is it, is it a secure site? Does it have an active, uh, active uh, uh, SSL certificate? Is it a trusted, I can't talk, is it a trusted certificate from an author from a authentic source or is it a self-assigned if it's self-assigned or there is um no certificate or it's expired i would really think long and hard before entering information on a site like that so are there are there any browsers that are better suited for stuff like this than others like is there you know you've heard of you know ones that are Almost full. I know things foolproof, but just in general, are there are there browsers browsers that you recommend more than others? Absolutely. Um, 
Edge, Chrome, Safari, uh, Firefox, I would stick to those four main okay. browsers for anything that requires security. There's there's other fun ones out there. I think there's Spark, there's others that are more AI driven browsers, but AI is for learning and it is collecting everything you enter to be to use to learn, to build its platform, to build its I don't want to be entering my credit card information or my personal information on something that can, I'm sure most people have used chat GPT to see what it can do, see the fun. All of that conversation you're having is, is recorded and added to its, its, it's just kind of like a human of its repository of what it knows. And we don't know, it's not been out long enough to be trusted of when's it going to share a secret it shouldn't share. It's not human to know, like, how many humans do you know that you can trust when you've shared a secret that it's not going to come out at the wrong time? All the more with with an untrusted, untested, um, bra AI based browser. And the same is true even just going to a, an AI search engine. Um, if you want it to create a resume for you, I, I wouldn't recommend putting in your accurate, true information for it to build a resume. Um, if you're looking for a, a sentence structure or a, using it there, but the more information you give it about who you are, what you've done, where you've been, the, the bigger profile it can build of who you are. And and then it can imitate you as well. Wow, thank you. It's scary. <laughs> and I think that's like a really interesting point. You know, I've, I've personally used GP, chat GPT, um, I, but I use it for like, what recipe should I cook this week? Because it's good at like giving you some mm -hmm. ideas, but I've seen people using it almost as like a, a living diary where like, it's like a, a providing some AI therapy help. Um, and, you know, there's some pros and cons to that, but definitely you're, you're providing all this information into a source. And if that gets hacked somehow, then now your life is, is an open book for, you know, the, the cyber attackers. And so I definitely think, you know, um, even for sites and apps that you mentioned that are sick, that we think that are pretty secure, nev nothing is 100% safe, uh, you know? Great. So I think that's really important to stress. Um, and along those lines, you know, when we talk about not just the websites, but devices that we have um, through, you know, United Way Suncoast, we go through trainings on, you know, if you are bringing your work laptop to an airport, don't sign into the, don't use it on the, the free Wi-Fi because it's open to everyone. Um, like, don't leave your laptops unattended. Um, I'm hoping our HR team is listening so they know I'm, I'm remembering these, yeah, these strategies. Um, but I think that these are some really important points. So I'd love to talk more about what risks that we have. So we we focused on, you know, making sure you don't overshare online, what websites to be cognizant of when you're visiting. But can you talk more about our smart devices, you know, our phones, our iPads, our laptops, and how we protect ourselves in, in ways that that other malicious actors can exploit our devices? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the ways is, you know, when you're in public, I, I highly recommend using um, the face ID or fingerprint ID rather than like a short four digit pin. Um, if you have to use a pen, increase that number. Anybody looking over your shoulder, watching any cameras that are posted. Um, and we're not talking about malicious actor that lives next door. We're talking about, as I said before, a multi-billion dollar industry that they've got you know, high tech, high minds on the on the process of trying to gain your information and 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 collect that money from you. Um, so using things that cannot be taken from you, your fingerprint, your uh, facial facial recognition for unlocking your device, those are things to help protect your your physical mobile device. Um, and then once you're in the phone, using um, what, being very careful and cautious of what you're downloading, just because an app is available for your device doesn't mean it's good for your device. Um, there are all kinds of, um, you know, apps and things that look fun and entertaining, but they also can collect our information as they're, as they're on our device, our usage time, our, you know, some devices are better than others at um, securing and segregating, but it's also a multi-billion dollar industry. And so just because today certain ones are ahead of the curve of, of separating out and not allowing one application access to another doesn't mean it always is. And so I think there's a, a level of conspiracy theorists of, okay, wait, what can this can it take from my phone? 
Um, and do I really want to put that on there? Um, and just, just because this game looks fun or Joe's playing with this game, do I really need to have that on there? What's the cost to me? It's not just the dollar to buy the game. It's what else can this eventually gain access to? I think a number of years ago, there was a, a breach or a, no, it wasn't even a breach. It was an ac accident at Facebook where they took all of the private messages and they became public. Um, and so here was something we thought was just between two people, three people, five, whatever of this private conversation, and it was turned public for a time. So whatever we do online, whether it's on our mobile devices, and I'm kind of going off here a little bit, do we trust that what they've secured or what we've given them is going to be secured for today? And is it secured for tomorrow? Like, did we sign a HIPAA agreement? What are they going to do when they, when our information, if we put this on there and it becomes public, what does it mean to them? What does that mean to us? And so being diligent, whether that's on our, our mobile device, in our email, or just online in general, we're not in the privacy of our own home. This device is out in, it's the key to the world. And it's no longer just what can somebody geographically close to me get a hold of and do, but what can someone in halfway across the country, halfway across the world get in and do? And what, do, what am I giving them access to? And I think those are really good points. And I would love if we could touch a little more on um, the Wi-Fi aspects of this. Because I think it's so mm -hmm. easy. Like there's so many places today where you go to and they offer free Wi-Fi. Either your phone will say, hey, this Wi-Fi is available. Do you want to sign in? Or, you know, you'll see a sign that says free Wi-Fi, whether you're in a coffee shop, an airport. Um, and so can you talk more about, you know, what the risks are of that and what information you shouldn't share? Because I know personally, I've not done the best in the past of, you know, I'm on, I'm at the coffee shop, I'm going to sign into my banking account and um, see, you know, what money I have in there or, you know, um, and so I would love to talk, we could talk more because I think it's, it's especially as more people are exposed to the Wi-Fi and the internet and, and free Wi-Fi that there's going to be a lot of risks if you have someone also in there that's hijacking into that Wi-Fi network and collecting information. Yep. So without going too technical of all of the information that's included in a, a packet as you send it, it, there is information they can, even if it's going to a secure uh, encrypted such as M365 or um, your bank account, it, it is a secure site you're going to. And so the information in transit is still encrypted, but what else are they able to get? What can they add to that packet? What can they um, uh, glean? What else can they get a hold of on? Maybe they can't get into your traffic because it's encrypted and going, but now your machine is open and sitting on that network. What can they add on to your machine, add on to your device or add on to your laptop to make it um, that it's now reporting the information or the keystrokes or um, out to Peggy from, the, I guess, the commercials. I don't know if you've all seen the commercials of this is Peggy and with the help desk of you're like, um, what, what is Peggy getting from me in whatever country that Peggy's sitting in um, looking for that information sending from my machine? So yes, you can run AV. Yes, you can run. But again, a billion dollar industry wants to stay a billion dollar industry and stay a step ahead. And so we're, security is always playing that piece of catch up. We're always looking for that loophole. We're always looking for what, um, where are they going to get in next? And they're always looking to get in and where is the next place? And so you don't know what you've missed until it's been breached, until it's been compromised. So do you want to take that risk that, oh, I'm secure, I'm okay, everything's or do you want to stay diligent of using, um, being careful of where you're getting into that information? You don't know who's looking over your shoulder. You don't know, um, you know, what what is on that line that's being compromised or also listening or trying to plant information on your on your machine. Thank you. Wow, that's scary. Um, one of the things that I mean, I deal with most of us deal with is the two factor author authentication. Uh, it's very recommended, but how really how effective is it? And um, are there specific scenarios that it may not provide sufficient protection against unauthorized access to your accounts? So 2FA is probably better than um, at this stage than even changing your password regularly. Um, 
because it requires that two the two things you have both what you know of your password and what you have for the 2FA. Um, the the challenge with 2FA right now is um, in the MFA fatigue where you get an alert pro, uh, approval and we just click oh approve oh approve and we're not really stopping to think wait is this me am I doing this did I initiate where is this coming from and we're just approving it so as I tell a lot of our um, clients and, and different people we work with is the human, the person involved, the end user is always the strongest link and the weakest link in protecting any environment, whether it's your own personal environment or the corporate environment. All it takes is the wrong click of, oh, approve. Wait, I didn't mean to approve that. And even with what I do for a living and I'm in it every day, day in and day out, I had it happen a couple months ago where this wasn't a, necessarily a, a 2FA thing, but it was a, a with my account, I got an email like or a text at four in the morning, five in the morning, something um, on on for my Amazon account. And it's like, oh, I know your password, your your password's expired or something. And in my droggy, just waking up, sleepy head, I read it. Oh, I'm like, oh, okay. I'll, and I start to do it. And it's like, as I start to wake up, I'm like, wait, what am I doing? This isn't right. And so I had to go in and resecure my password, resecure my account. Now I do have 2FA on it, so it wouldn't be just enough to get my password. But it's those um, times where they're looking for where we're asleep or where we're just fatigue of just click and just, oh, yep. Please. But if it's prompting you, that's our security net. That's our chance. If you're flying on the high trapeze, if you just start clicking through, you're flying without a net. And that's your chance, that prompt is your chance, is your net to say, hey, wait, stop and think, should I be allowing this through? And we're all, you know, guilty of, we just leave the door, front door unlocked because we're coming right back or we leave and we click on through, but that to stay diligent, to stay engaged of, wait, this is asking for me for security. Am I going to open this door and let this person through? Or am I, wait, this, you don't belong here. That's, I think, the biggest challenge with 2FA right now or MFA is that approval fatigue of just clicking it through. And and I definitely appreciate the the security of t- t- 2FA. Um, for me, I still struggle with it because I'm like, oh, great, now I got to get my phone, like, and stuff. So it's, it, I've all, I, I still, I'm still working on it, but I understand it's important. So Amy, I appreciate you emphasizing how it's, it's, it, it, it's great to hear it's, it's even more secure than changing your password because that was, for years, it was change your password every 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and then I'm great. All right. Now I have to remember which password's which. So it's nice that the industry is always working on, you know, what are even safer things that we can be doing. Um, and uh, looking at where we're at right now. So it's 2023. Um, over the past, even it seems like a, just a couple of years, like online shopping has become bigger than ever before. You know, at, uh, stores are really transitioning to offer an online shopping platform in addition or in replacement to the brick and mortar stores. Um, and so I, I don't imagine anytime soon we're going to see um, folks be having less chances to potentially expose their financial security okay. online. And so I really, you know, looking toward the future um, and, you know, educating folks, especially, you know, students, children on what about digital security. Um, And so I would like to talk about, you know, how you think that we can frame this when we're talking to not just our friends and family, but also, you know, children, students in classrooms about the importance of digital security. um, And what are some practical approaches that parents, educators, um, people just out and about in the community can take to talk about and instill, you know, good cybersecurity practices? Mm-hmm. Well, for kids, it's all the, the more important. It's not just financial, but it's their physical safety and security. Um, and so, you know, it used to be when I grew up, my age here, stranger danger of you don't, you know, who do you pay attention to who you talk to on the street? And with my own kids, um, we didn't, it wasn't necessarily stranger danger, but it was who do you talk to? If you were get separated from me, who are you? Who is the safest player, person to go to? Um, you know, and, and you you talk about how do you analyze your situation and where you are? Um, 
Are, are you going to go to the shady man sitting on the park bench watching all the kids? Or are you going to go to the mom watching or pushing a stroller with four other kids with her? And, you know, good, bad, I don't know of, of stereotyping or, or looking at that, but I, I'm going to send my kids, I'm going to encourage them to talk to the mom with the baby stroller or nursing a baby with three other kids with her or four other kids with her before I'm going to say, go talk to the man who's just sitting on the park bench watching. Um it's kind of evaluating where's the risk and where um, where is the safest place to look and where is the safest place to go. So I equate it, I give a physical example of the natural world um, because the, the virtual world is, is the same, like it's just that, but virtualized. And so if we can take that kind of mindset of what are our safest options? You're not going to want to go to a site that you've never shopped from before and you've never heard anybody shop from before. And they have, I mean, we can all look at a website and go, that looks a little sketchy. Like, yeah, the price is great. But whereas, you know, you can get on, there are tried and true ones, Amazon, Macy's. Um, I can't think of any other stores at the moment. Oh, maybe, I don't know. Um, just stores that are, and I'm not trying to pop push big box stores, but you know what their website looks like. You know what the security looks like on it. And so then if you're going to branch out a few years ago, my uh, daughter started shopping on, I think it's called, is it Sheen? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. And at first I'm like, let's start small. Like, well, so-and-so bought from there and so-and-so. I'm like, okay, but let's start small. Like we didn't just go on and do a huge shopping spree. Um, we had them evaluate and look at the website. Okay, wait, how do we know that it's safe? Where are they doing the credit card information? Is it secure? And then also using things that our credit cards have of a lot of credit cards today will offer a rolling credit card number to use online, a one-time credit card number transaction. Um, you can use that number. If it's shady, they can't reuse it. You, you're out what you were of that one transaction um, but they can't take that number then and apply it to Best Buy or, you know, wherever else to ship themselves a 95 inch TV. Um, so those are some of the ways, um, can that you, we can, um, our children. no, no, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, can, so I know this is getting a little technical, but, um, something that I'm like remembering and so some websites they'll have like the HTTPS or mm -hmm. they'll have like a green symbol or something. Can you talk about mm -hmm. like, if I go on a website and I've maybe never gone on it before, like what are some like ways that you can say this is safer than maybe another website out there? Or are there mm -hmm. any dead giveaways on what websites are, websites are good versus what websites are, might have, you know, be like, maybe you shouldn't put your information on them. Well, one, always check and double check the spelling of what you've entered or the link you followed. Um, it, it may look like eBay, but it might be eBay.co instead of eBay.com or or have an extra B in it. Or And I'm not trying to you know pick on any certain sites or um, promote any certain sites or just ones that come to mind. Um, but they'll oftentimes imitate uh, an a existing or a, and count on our human failure of like our human humanness of double typing certain letters or transposing certain letters. And it'll look very similar to your legitimate website, but wait, I got redirected. This is .net and I need .com. Like, so being alert and paying attention and not just going, I, oh, it's me. I must, I must forgotten what it looks like. Take, take, trust that gut check instinct of like, wait, this looks, doesn't look right. And stop and take a look at it. Um, you mentioned the green um, logo. A lot of that comes with uh, certain antivirus uh, applications or um, browser um, security checks. What you can, what will be true and consistent across the board is that Edge, Chrome, and Safari all have that lock icon. Um, up to the, it's generally, I think, in the upper left of the address bar. Um, and if that lock is there, you know it's an HTTPS website versus just HTTP, which means that it it's trans, um, the information to it is transferred securely, it's transferred encrypted, um, and that it is 
legitimate of who it says it is. Somebody can't just come in and um, imitate that site. However, if it's not the right site, is it like eBay with two Bs can be a secure site. So you, it's not just enough to see that lock. You need to, to verify that where you've gone is where you went to go um, and that the, the security, uh, you can click on that lock and it will tell you information about that, that certificate. Who authorized, like who is the authorizing um, provider? Is it expired? Is it active? Um, and it'll give you more information in there of who owns that that certificate. So Amy, there's a lot of threats out there. There's a lot of things we have to watch out for. What's the next big thing in security and the next big threats out there that we need to kind of keep an eye out for? AI. AI, I, okay. I mean, it's cool. And it can do some awesome things and save us some some work and some um, effort and, and streamline things and automate things. But there's always the flip side. There's always a cost to every every benefit or everything we move along. There's always a flip side. Um, and just like we talked about earlier, the browsers, what are we putting in there? And so it's just being aware of, yeah, this is really cool, but it's no longer like the Teddy Ruxpin we had when when we were kids that talked to us and it's not going anywhere. This is now out online and anybody can get a hold of it. I'm probably aging myself with Teddy Ruxpin, but <laughs> um, it's no longer just what can stay right there. It's out there for everybody. And so as you're testing it, as you're playing with it, as you are, um, oh, well, I can do this so much faster with, but at what cost? What are you giving it? And are the security things in place to protect that? Do you think we'll get to a point where AI can come up with your passwords for other organizations, like it, based upon the information that you have and the, how well AI knows you down the road, they may say, oh, this Pete's, Pete's password's cat, you know, mm -hmm. really. I'm sure it's not cat though, right? Pete? Yeah, no, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> Absolutely. There's... um with all of the information we have put out there on social media, on, on sharing of different things, our, our browsing history. I mean, probably 10 years ago, I was talking to a friend who works for an insurance company. And he said, when you call in with just your cell phone number, they can pull up a minimum of a thousand data points on you. This was 10 years ago. A thousand data points just from your cell phone number before they've even picked up the phone to talk to you. And they use that, they, their um, they, processes or analytics, whatever, would put up to them of these are the products you should try to sell this person because based on their purchase history, based on their all of these things we know about them, these are the things that they are most likely to buy um, or need or what have you. So if they could do that 10 years ago with just our cell phone number, how much more do they have on us today? And now if AI has access to that and can search it so, so quickly, they may, it may know us better than we know ourselves. Of, that's and, and that's and where I think not. using a password manager, I'm sorry, using a password manager, like uh, Apple has one built in for free. If you happen to be an iPhone user or an iCloud user, um, Keychain is, is a pretty good, secure, free option. It can create that strong password for you that it's not, oh, Pete loves cats. His password's going to be cat, you know, Yeah. Wow. But, and then birth year or something. And so using that strong password that's created for you is going to be a lot more secure. And then you don't have to remember it. It hmm. can be auto entered from your phone, from your, that you remember one longer secure password. Um, and there's other options out there. We, um, as an organization, uh, give all of our uh, managed service clients uh, keeper Keeper security passwords, keeper password manager, I think. I just call it keeper. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but um, but that one has a fee to it to use. Um, but it's a good solid secure. And so using something like that is a good way, you know, to keep your password secure where AI can't necessarily guess based on what it knows about you. Oh, we know your kids' names are, you know, Sally, Joe, and and Ben. So on that note, so I have a, a follow-up question and then 
my um, friend actually, who's not able to join us today, they also have a question they'd love to hear during the recording of this. Um, so my question is, you know, we talked about uh, two-factor authentication. We've talked about, you know, password management. Um, I think there's a lot of information out there on what makes a strong password. Um, some people say um, the best passwords are just three words. And some say, you know, multiple numbers. And, you know, and I, I there's this joke that you have to basically, you know, give up your firstborn these days when you're making new passwords because of all the demands from them. Um, and so can you give some examples on what makes a strong password? You know, how often you should change it? Just some proper password management. Mm -hmm. um, the longer, the better. Um, you know, if you can get past, you know, eight, six, eight characters, not overly secure. And I don't have the statistics in my, uh, off the top of my head of how fast those can be broken by a, a, a average computer today, but it's pretty quick. It's like within the hour, a, a standard computer today can, um, decode those. You start getting 12 characters, 16 characters, um, even adding in a repeating character, will add to the security of that password. Um, I think I have most of mine set to 20 characters when it, um, they're not ones I remember. They're ones that I use my password manager to auto enter. And I just have it set that I want it to be 20 characters. Um, you know, using a combination of capital, lowercase, um, special characters, um, whatever the, you know, different sites have different requirements of what they'll allow. Some will allow, a percentage sign, some won't. Um, but the longer you make it, the longer it's going to take any automation to decipher that, to decode that. Um, so that's that's one good way. I, you know, for a lot of the sites that I don't necessarily pull up my password manager for or before I had a password manager, I had a pattern that I would use to set for my password so that they weren't matching because that that's one of the biggest um risks out there is if you use the same password and the yep. same username for all your accounts, um, you get one, you've got them all. And mm -hmm. so I would do a variation of that, um, that I would know what it was based on what the website I was going on. And so it just changed out a couple letters based on the, the website I was visiting or where I was authenticating to that I could, so I could still remember it, but they could all be different. Um, so there's some tips, some tricks like that that you can do, but a password manager is especially one that has MFA built into it. Like, yeah. And that's, that's so helpful. Cause I think like these days you have your passwords on potentially hundreds of websites. And so trying to manually remember which password goes to which you're going to get yourself locked out and, you know, mm -hmm. writing them down on a piece of paper isn't safe either. If someone breaks in your house or you have a family member or a friend that sees it. Um, so I definitely take away from that is, uh, a password manager. Um, and as you mentioned, there are free versions available out there. You don't have to pay a lot of money for it. Um, Peter, before I get to my friend's question, do you have any other questions or anything? I'm, I'm okay. good. It's been very informative. Definitely. I'm, I like to think that I know how to keep myself safe online, but you always learn something new each time you have these conversations. Um, and so my friend had asked me, they, within the past couple of years, had been the victim of like an email phishing attack. Like so they had clicked on a link um, that was from like their bank supposedly and they logged in and then their bank actually, like the money was removed out of it. And um, while they were able to get it back eventually, this is just like, it was a huge red flag kind of thing. And something that they wanted to ask is um, what are some like good techniques for, so we talked about websites, we talked about all that um, for emails. You know, it's it can, during this time of the year, you get so many emails from businesses, you know, your banks, all that kind of stuff saying, hey, make sure you, you know, click on this link for the latest deals or, you know, your password needs to be reset. Click here. Can you talk more about, you know, ways when we're getting these emails that we could say, you know, maybe this isn't uh, like a good email. Maybe if I click, if I click on this link, something bad will happen. And then can you talk about like the different ways that emails can be used as like a cyber attack weapon? Mm -hmm. So first, if I could just share something I do personally, is I try not to follow links from emails for my bank account, for authorizing to log in, um, unless I have just gone to the website or to the app, app and sent, requested a new password reset or request, 
I don't follow the links in my email. So unless I've initiated it, I try really hard not to follow those because of what happened to me a few months ago where it came in and it was like, I just tired and I clicked it and then started and it's like, no, don't do that. So I try not to follow those because anybody can spoof, can look like your bank. Anybody can spoof my email address and make it look like it's coming from me. Um, And so a way to make just a good practice so that I don't get that brain fog, I'm tired and just clicking through is I make it, I try to make muscle memory that I don't follow those links. I go, I try to create a, um, a favorite in my browser for my banks, for my um, things that I log into so that I, or an app that I'm following so that I don't, or I, I have it memorized that I type what I'm going to rather than following a link in an email, just as that double check of if my bank's telling me that I need to log in. Well, wait, why is my bank telling me I need to log in? That's not a common, normal thing they ask me to do. So I will go to the, the website or I will go to the app rather than following the link. Um, and then that just kind of takes away that risk of, oh, click and not thinking mm-hmm. and, and going there. Um, some other things to watch for when you're in your email. Um if you hover over the email address, most email uh, browsers will show you who it's really coming from. Not the display name, but the email address. Now there's some really good spoofing that can make it look like it's coming from a legitimate email address as well as the, the, the name. But that's an obvious one is when you hover over it and it's a it says it's coming from you, know, you at, at United Way, but it's a Gmail account. Well, that's probably not you at United Way if it's a Gmail <laughs> account or it's not my bank. Um, so that's, you know, hovering over that will help um, without having to get too technical of getting into the header information of, of where it's coming from. Um, and looking at the whole domain, just because you start to read that it has United Way in it, is it really United Way Suncoast.org? Yes, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Um, is it really from there or does it .com? Oh, wait, somebody bought the same one with .com and now they're sending emails. Um, those things happen. We see them on a regular basis. Um, and that's why we do email filtering for, for organizations, um, on a personal level, it's hard to have, to be able to afford to have email filtering. And so we have to be diligent on our own to watch for those things. Something I do is when, um, I have, I use Gmail as my private personal account. Um, and I think you can do the same with iCloud, but I need to check that. You can put a period anywhere in your username. So if your username is Joe Smith, you could have J period rest of Joe Smith in the username at gmail.com. That email will still come into your inbox, but you can create filters with that to use then for junk mail, for you signed up for um, this newsletter or that newsletter. And so that kind of separates it and segregates it from um, from your bank information or from your, and you can set a filter in your Gmail to, to, to group those in a different way or to, um, to alert you that when messages are coming from that, it's more likely that they are spam, junk, or, or malicious intent than, you know, if it's one that you reserve back, say you put a period between every letter for the very important stuff, you know, how, however you decide to do that, that is an option that's in there that can kind of help identify and separate out the masses of junk we get from the things that are legitimate. That's really helpful. Thank you. Because we get so much these days. So having that, those separate accounts might be really beneficial. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So Amy, as we, can, as we kind of wrap up here, what would be your top two or three takeaways and or key points that you know, we need to know to keep ourselves safe in cybersecurity? Um, stop and think. Always stop and think. I mean, it's the simple, easy stuff of stop and think. Um, if you wouldn't let somebody in your front door, if you wouldn't share that, you know, in the public, if you wouldn't shout that information in a public square, don't put it online. Um, you know, if you didn't sign a HIPAA agreement, don't put it online. Um, you know, where it's going to keep it, if you don't trust them, if you don't have an agreement with them that says they're legally bound to protect this information, they're not going to protect that information. Um, 
and so just I think stay diligent, stay diligent, stay diligent is is the is the biggest key. Um, and not allowing the the distractions, the busyness of of life and especially of this Christmas season to or holiday season just to to click through. Oh, I oh another alert click and oh, why did I do that? Um are I think are the biggest things. Thank you, Amy. I and the reason that we really wanted to have this this session and, and have you join us today is because you know, this isn't just about keeping your information safe. It's because like, if your information is compromised, you know, this could impact your credit score. Absolutely. It could in- impact your ability to take out loans to, you know, you could it, have money taken out of your, o- your bank account. And now you're, you're overdrafted hundreds of dollars. You know, there's a lot of implications that this can have on your financial stability. So we wanted to make sure, especially Amy, as you mentioned, this time of the year, when everyone is, you know, doing their online shopping, um, it can be really easy to, you know, just slip up and it only takes one time. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it doesn't take, you know, multiple events for something bad to happen. It could be just one thing and that could ruin a lot. So, um, you know, Amy, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to join us today. Um, we really appreciate you being able to share your expertise and knowledge, um, you know, because money matters. We want to make sure that, you know, cybersecurity is something that's always top of mind for folks. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. And for those who are with us right now, still live, um, uh, after the uh, webinar ends today, you will be asked to complete a very brief satisfaction survey. Um, We ask that you complete this so that we can make sure as we're planning out the next year of Money Matters, that we are making sure it is um, as satisfying and educational for you as possible. Um, So please complete that. Um, And then you can also make sure you watch all of our previous Money Matter webinars on YouTube. Of your, or you can go on our website and look them up there. We have covered things from budgeting to credit scores, disaster preparedness, and more. Um, so definitely make sure you check out those webinars if you haven't um, done so already. Um, and then with regards to our upcoming one in January, um, Peter, would you like to give everyone a spoiler on what we'll be covering? Spoiler alert, our next uh, Money Matters uh, webinar is going to be January 8th, 2024. Um, and we're going to focus on Vita and getting uh, your your taxes prepared for free, which is great. So awesome. we're looking forward to that one. Thank you so much, Peter. Excited to see everyone um, in the new year. Um, Amy, once again, thank you for joining us. Peter, thank you for co-hosting. Um, and everyone have a great rest of your day.